good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Songbook Academy. My name is Renee Laschiazza, and I am the Director of Programs here at the Great American Songbook Foundation, founded by five-time Grammy nominee Michael Feinstein. Today is the final day of this year's Songbook Academy Summer Music Intensive for high school singers, and we are so excited to, bring, to be bringing you a wonderful presentation exploring the business side of pursuing a career in the arts. So if you do enjoy today's presentation, please consider supporting these kinds of educational opportunities through the lens of the Great American Songbook by texting SONGBOOK, all caps, one word, to 91999 or visiting the songbook.org slash donate. Before I introduce you to our wonderful speaker today, I want to say a special thank you to our education and engagement sponsors, Libby and Randy Brown, our national program partner, the Ephraimson Family Fund, and of course, our Ella Fitzgerald Gerald, Char Charitable Foundation Mentor Champions who make everything we do possible. Now I'm so very pleased to introduce you to Jonathan Flom, who is an international musical theater educator, a stage director, and a multi-published author. He currently serves as head of education at the Danish National School of Performing Arts Musical Academy, Fredericia. I think I said that correctly. But Jonathan, you can correct me. Uh, but I met him when he was the head of musical theater at Shenandoah Conservatory. Jonathan is a passionate and empowering educator and mentor, and you are absolutely in for a treat today. So please help me welcome Jonathan. Thanks, Renee. It was so much fun to, to be here with everybody. It's, uh, it's 6 p.m. here in Denmark. Um, so uh, you guys are probably all sort of waking up still and we're sort of wrapping winding down our day um, but it's it's great to be able to connect through zoom so thanks for inviting me um, yeah well listen we don't have a whole lot of time um, and this information I'm going to share with you is something that is actually part of an entire semester long uh, course so I'm going to condense a semester into about 45 minutes and hopefully leave time for questions um, but uh, as we go along, uh, if there are questions or comments, uh, I, I would love this to be as interactive as possible. So I'll just leave it to, to you wonderful people to jump in if, if, you, if you have a question or if you want me to expand on something or if you want me to move it along um, so that it is relevant to you. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit more of my background just so that you have context for how I came into this work that I'm gonna share with you. Um, and I'll try and be brief. I will try. Um, I have a BFA in musical theater from Penn State University. I went to Penn State before it was good, um, at least good as a musical theater school. Um, it was still very much developing, uh, as was I in a way. Um, and about halfway through my journey in the musical theater education, it dawned on me uh, that I think maybe I should be a director and not a performer. And I was terrified to share that with anybody. Uh, I was terrified to even admit it out loud to myself because I thought, oh that's giving up you're quitting you know you're you, people are going to be disappointed in you blah 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 all those stories that we tell ourselves and for some reason I got the courage to go to the head of the program and I knocked on his door and I said to him hey I, I think maybe I'm a director and not a performer and I'll never forget he looked at me and he smiled and he said yeah we, we know that we've all known that we were waiting for you to discover that and, and it was such a revelation because I thought oh they're going to kick me out of the program they're going to tell me to go do something else and they didn't. What they did was created a sort of path for me to develop those skills that I wanted to develop and to move more towards directing and to still foster my love for musical theater, but do it from the director's lens. And I was very, very fortunate that I got that kind of support. I moved to New York after grad school and started uh, doing some directing, uh, freelance, small projects, little things, whatever I could pick up. And then I got invited three years later to come back to Penn State and get a master's degree. And they wanted me because they wanted a guinea pig for this new program that was directing for musical theater. And I had never thought of going to grad school. I'd never thought that an MFA was in my future. But after talking to some friends and mentors, I thought, OK, why not? It's free. It's three years. We'll see where it lands me. And within the first year, they had me teaching a class as part of my assistantship. And I never in a million years thought I wanted to be a teacher. But the minute I stood in that room and talked to students, I was like, OK, this is it. And that's what I've done with my life. And I do direct, um, obviously, at the schools where I've worked. And, and I 
try to direct professionally as often as I can, but generally speaking, most of my life has been focused on teaching. And I sort of discovered that because I allowed myself to just be open to, to these things. And I didn't force myself to stay in that box of, well, you're getting a BFA in musical theater, so therefore you shall follow this prescribed path. I hope that makes sense. And I think it's really important as an introduction to what I'm gonna share with you, because nobody ever taught me any of this stuff. Nobody ever sat me down and said, hey, follow your heart, trust your instincts, figure out who you are first, and then pursue something. Everything we were taught was sort of, here's the box. If you want to be in a musical theater field or an arts field, whatever it is, singer, dancer, actor, you have to follow these instructions, and this is the prescription to do it. And I think we all know that that's unrealistic. And I think that's a very old-fashioned notion. But nobody had really kind of at least in my experience, come with, with a, a prescription for how do you figure out who you are and what your individual path is. And so over the years, long story short, I started getting really nerdy about this whole idea of branding and, and looked at businesses and thought, well, you know, they've, they've mentioned to us in school that, well, you are a business, right? You are, you incorporated, but they never told us what that meant. And they never told us how we could use that information. And so I've spent the better part of the last 10 years digging deep into that, reading business books, reading uh, everything about branding and marketing and um, you know, product development and thought, okay, how can this apply to us as artists? And, and I've sort of forged that as my path. And that's the information that I essentially want to share with you all today. And, and uh, again, I'm going to be very brief and sort of give you the quick and dirty. At the end of this all, I'm going to send Renee um, a PDF of the, of the presentation. I may get through all of it. I may get through some of it. I, who knows? Uh, but I'm going to go, I'm going to move fairly quickly. Normally, this would be a lot more interactive. But in the interest of time, I just kind of want to give you, you all a taste, uh, some things to think about. And then if you're interested, you can dig deeper. You can you know, I'll give you a reading list um, where you can contact me afterwards. But I want to start by saying, I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, share screen. Boom. Are you seeing my screen? Awesome. Great. Okay. Let me play this. So I want to start by saying that everything I'm going to talk to you all about today comes from this idea of empowerment. Right, so some of you may be thinking, I'm not interested in a brand right now. I'm 17 years old, I'm 16 years old. What do I need to know about that? And hopefully by the end of this, you'll, you'll walk away going, okay, I can see how that could apply to me now. Some of you might be thinking, oh, this guy's a musical theater guy. I don't wanna do musicals. I wanna sing, I wanna be a recording artist. I wanna be a songwriter. I think this can, I think this can apply. I really do. I've taught this course. Originally it was created for theater performance majors, but then suddenly stage managers and dance majors and sing, singer songwriters at Shenandoah started taking this course because they were getting a lot out of it. And I think the core of the information is about empowerment. How do we shift the power back to us as artists? Because if you think about it, so much of what we do as artists is we give our power away. We go to an audition, you're immediately giving a ton of your power away. I hope they hire me. I hope they cast me. I hope they'll listen to my demo. I hope somebody will, will take an interest in me when I you know, play my guitar and sing at the coffee shop. You give so much of your power away. And this philosophy, this work that I've developed is about taking the power back on yourself. And we're gonna talk a little bit about this word branding. I'm not gonna dig too, too deeply into it because I think you're all young and this is not the time that you should be worrying about creating your brand. But some of these concepts I think can be helpful to you, especially if you're gonna go into auditions for, uh, for colleges, universities and stuff like that. So let me start by asking if, if, if we can do this um, in an orderly way. Does anybody have any sort of thoughts on what branding is? What does that word mean to you when you hear, oh, this guy's gonna talk about branding? What is a brand? Like how you sell yourself as an artist. Great. I love that. How you sell yourself as an artist. That's great. Thank you. Any other thoughts? It can be like the clothes you wear or how you act. Like if you think about Aubrey, um, Aubrey Plaza, she has a very particular way she acts. And so that's kind of like a mini brand of hers. Such and a crush on Aubrey Plaza. That's a great example. That's a great, no, that's absolutely right. The, 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 
the way you dress, the way you present yourself. Good. Any other, any other thoughts? You guys are super on target with all of this. I think it's like what you want people to think about when they think of you. Absolutely. Perfect answer. So all of, all, all of you are absolutely right. And, and I hope, again, I hope you can see that even though we're not going to get into the, the nitty gritty of you all creating your own businesses right now at this age, right? But that, that at least you can start to think of, oh, I want people to think a certain way of me. Oh, I have some control over that. There is some empowerment to that. So I consider branding to be the recognition of a product. That's the very, very, very simplified version of it. But we see something and we recognize it and our brain psychologically is wired to have certain reactions. So I'm gonna put an image on the screen and you can unmute yourselves and this may be a little chaotic, but it'll be fun. Um, I just want you to respond to the image that you see on the screen, not with necessarily exactly what it means, but what it signifies to you. What do you think of when you see this? Food. Food. Fries. I'm loving it. Fries, I'm loving it. What a big Mac. A fast food. The clown. Yeah. An ice cream machine. A broken ice cream machine. <laughs> Sad broken ice cream machine. What else? Grimace. Oh, good. Grimace. Apple pie. Apple pie. Very unhealthy. Okay. That one documentary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Supersize, supersize me, supersize it, whatever that was. Yeah. Any, any others? Yes, no, good, okay. Point, the point here that I wanna make to you is that not one person said yellow letter M. Nobody said that because we don't see a yellow letter M. We see McDonald's and we see everything that we've been taught that McDonald's stands for. Our brain is hotwired to see that yellow letter. You're driving down the, the highway, you're on a road trip with your family and you've been driving for hours and hours and dad didn't want to stop to let anybody pee. And you know, and the dog is circling in the back and needs to, to get out and get some air. And you see that yellow letter M off in the distance and you know exactly what that means. And I think we can agree, somebody said unhealthy. I think we can agree that not everybody loves McDonald's. Right. I, I love doing this, uh, this lecture in all sorts of rooms and all sorts of countries because I always ask this question. I always say, how many of you love McDonald's? And usually in these groups, I get four or five people that raise their hand and they sort of look ashamed about it. And I say, how many of you will eat McDonald's if it's sort of like the only option or if you've been drinking, of course, if you're old enough to drink and all that, you know, and then you get a few more. But for the most part, more, more than 50% of the audiences that I present this lecture to say, I don't like McDonald's. No, 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 not if it's the last food on earth. I'm, I want to be healthy. And, I, and it makes me think to myself, well, gee, McDonald's is doing okay for themselves, aren't they? Even though they don't have my business or, or maybe your business. And I think that's really, really important. McDonald's has a brand. It's very identifiable. We know exactly what it is. We know exactly what we're getting. Some people love it some people absolutely hate it. And they don't try and figure out how can we get those people that hate us? They just do their thing, right? McDonald's, you know, McDonald's isn't going, well, people seem to like sushi. Let's, we better serve sushi, right? They stick to their thing. They've, ex they've certainly expanded over the years. They used to just be burgers and fries. So they've, they've got a lot more than that. But essentially McDonald's is a company that, that everybody knows what it is, you know exactly what you're getting, and they're not really interested in trying to make sure that everybody loves them. Does that make sense? Are you, are you all with me on that? Awesome. We're gonna do, oops, hold on one second. My screen is being funny here. Let me get rid of the chat, go away. Oh my God, I'm so bad at sharing my screen. Okay, here we go. Same, same exercise, react to this. What do you see? Technology. Apple. Price. Apple. Expensive. Glass. iPhone. Generation. The back of my computer. That old guy who made it. Steve um, Jobs. Yeah, that guy. Good. In the interest of time, I'm gonna cut, I'm gonna cut cut the little participation thing short. But you can see this can go on for a long time. And again, just like with McDonald's, we're gonna get a lot of people who have great feelings about this, right? Who like that's me. I couldn't live without my iPhone and my MacBook. And then there are gonna be other people who see it as overpriced, expensive, 
um, you know, technological super giant. There, there are good feelings and there are bad feelings. But again, you see that logo and you know exactly what it is. So this is the power of branding, my friends, right? That you can see an image and so much information comes to you. Your brain is hot wired to see more than just a, a silver apple or a yellow letter F. So now we're gonna try the same exercise with a slightly different approach. I'm gonna show you a couple of images that you don't know, but I would like you to take a look at these images and see what kind of information you get from them. Uh -huh. What do you see here? Kind. Okay. Professional. Headshot. Confident. Perform like, together. Fierce. What else? What do you know about her as a human? What, what impressions do you get just from, and don't be afraid of being wrong, right? This is, this, you're going to look at this picture and some of you are going to have good feelings, positive feelings. Some of you are going to maybe have negative feelings. It's all good. What information do we get about her? She She's looks confident, friendly, outgoing, very strong. Are there any roles we can sort of automatically lump her into in, in the casting world? Hmm? The boss. The boss. Any other thoughts? I mean, she's kind of ethnically ambiguous. Ethnically ambiguous, yeah. Very but much so. Like... She's actually of Middle Eastern descent, but she can certainly slot into all sorts of ethnic universes. One more, what about this guy? British. <laughs> okay. Got it all figured out. Oh, interesting. Also, yeah. right. parental. I see like humorous. Okay. I see like an office worker. Uh, Boss. I think because of his eyes, he looks a little colder than the warmer, darker eyes. His eyes are colder a little bit, but not just like, not him. Right. Good. So again, this is something that if I were in the room with you and we had two or three hours time, we would go much deeper and, and, and spend more time on this. But I think you get the point. The point is you look at these pictures and you get information. And it's not a question of whether you're right or wrong, but it's a quest, it, what it is, is it's psychology, right? Your brain sees these pictures, just like McDonald's, you've been trained to see that letter M and get a lot of information. We see these headshots and we know, oh, it's an actor. Okay, what kind of roles can they play? What world do they live in? These actors are telling a story with their headshot. You might want to buy what they're selling. I've, I've, I've had, especially with this guy, with uh, his name's Michael, um, I've had a very mixed reaction to this picture. I've had some people who are like, oh, he seems so kind and humorous and fun and other people who find him to be creepy uh, or off-putting in some way. There's no right or wrong answer and there's no way that Mike can appeal to everybody, right? Maybe you have uh, an ex-boyfriend who looks like him and so automatically you're, you're inclined to dislike him for that reason. Um, maybe you have a, a brother or a cousin who, who looks like him and you're automatically inclined to like him for that reason. There is no telling what the individual psychology is going, how, how the individual psychology is going to respond to any given person. But the point is, he's telling a story with this picture. Okay. And so as artists, I think every artist should eventually develop a brand that says, what type of artist are you? What makes you special? Here's a, a friend of mine who's obviously a dancer. And again, if, if we were really taking the time and, and had a couple hours, I would, I would ask you to respond to this. But in short, I'm gonna point out to you that you can see in the picture, she's very contemporary and very sort of commercial and edgy. She's making a big statement with that picture. Is it possible that she can be a, a prima ballerina in a nutcracker company? Absolutely, she has the skills to do that. Is that how she's trying to sell herself? And is that where her bread and butter is going to be? No. So the point I'm trying to make to, to you with, with these examples is that your pursuit over the next bunch of years should be in figuring out, okay, what's my thing? What is it that I'm selling? I cannot be all things to all people. There's no way that my music is going to appeal to everybody or that my acting is going to appeal to everybody or that I'm going to be the right type for every role that I audition for. So what is it that I want to say? 
how can I become comfortable in my own skin and in my own artistry, and then use that to step forward and confidently audition or, or put myself out there and not worry about feeling rejected, not take it personally. Does that make sense? Yes, good, okay. Sometimes branding can go wrong and I'm just gonna throw this up on the screen and let you digest it for a moment or two and ask you for your, yeah, I, I can already see people uh, on my screen reacting to it. What, what's going on here? What's, how does this make you feel? So wrong. Why is it so wrong, Piper Murphy? It, because it's just like not right at all. I don't know why. It's like Google shouldn't be in like the Coca-Cola font because that just looks weird. Except Google is actually probably the most, Google and Sony are the ones that look the most okay because Google changes up its logo like every day with the like online with the like different artists. So like maybe that would be a thing. Like maybe Sony would do some sort of promotional Indiana love statue, I don't know, acceptance thing that might be a thing, but the other ones. Yeah, it's a stretch, right? It's, we look at this and our instant reaction is something is wrong, right? Because McDonald's logo should not be used by Macintosh. Nike's logo should not be used by Nike. And these logos are so recognizable that the minute you put a different company into that brand, we have an instant reaction. Friends, this is what happens when an actor or an artist goes into audition for something and tries to be something that they're not, right? I'm gonna walk in and I'm gonna show them that with my skills and my training, I can sing that, even though it's not who I am fundamentally. Well, is it possible? that you can sing that? Sure, of course it is. You're trained, hopefully. Uh, you have a skill set beyond just a small box. But ultimately, people are going to see your true authentic self behind whatever costume you put on. I hope that makes sense. And I, I love this slide. It always, always gets the same reaction every time I do it, no matter what I do it. Um, two seconds. See, I have to stop opening the chat while I'm also in a screen save mode or screen share mode because then I get totally baffled by it. I would say if you if you need to jump in and say something, just unmute yourself and say it because if I keep trying to follow the chat, then I'm gonna get completely lost like I am. So we're talking about empowerment, right? So let's explore all the things that are not in your control. Things that we worry, what are things, what are some things that you think about or worry about sometimes as an artist? Maybe you're thinking about going to an audition, for example, or something like that. And you, you, you find yourself getting worried about things that are absolutely out of your control. What kind of things come to your mind when we think about height. it? Your height. Oh. Height. Yeah, and right. age. Age, totally out of your control. Maybe how the casting director is feeling that day, if they're having like a crappy day and that's why they don't give you a, a great fair chance. I cannot tell you how often that happens and you have no idea what's happened just before you or earlier in the day. So you can't control their mood. Great answer, what else? Whether or not they like your brand or are looking for what you have to bring to the table. Totally. Absolutely. You, it's not in your control, but we worry about it so much, right? We worry about it. We walk in there and we oh, I hope they like me. I hope they like me. And then we walk out and we think about it and, and, and we spend time dwelling on it after the fact. Um, not in our control. What else? Literally just the way that you look. Yeah. I mean, there are certain things that we can modify and we're going to talk about that on the next slide, but essentially your overall look, your physique, the way, the way you've entered the world and the way you are physically presented, there's only so much flexibility that we have. What else? Um, whether or not somebody had a great audition right before you or after you, or if, if, if they found the person or if they're going to find the person, like you don't know. So totally. I can't tell you how many times I've, I've, been directing a show or have been behind the table of a show that's being produced and someone walks in and they're so perfect for a specific role except that role's already been cast and we sit there behind the table and go wow she was so great what oh i'd love to have her in you know if we do this again and she walks out of that audition and thinks oh i crushed it and i'm perfect for the role and then she never gets the job and she dwells on it and she thinks oh what did i do wrong not in your control you didn't do anything wrong you just 
walked into an audition where you were perfect for a role that was already cast? These are great answers. And again, just in the interest of time, let me share some thoughts that I had written down. Uh, gender, we didn't mention gender, uh, age you hit, height, uh, your ethnicity or your race, your voice type, what they're looking for, what they think about you. So, so, so you guys hit most of these. And I think that's really important. Why am I sharing this with you? Why are we talking about what's not in your control? Because we spend way too much time dwelling on this. You can't change it. It's not in your control. You can't be older or younger, taller or shorter. You, I can't become a deep bass or, or, a, or a high soprano. Um, and I can't control what they're looking for. So why am I gonna waste time doing it? Where should my attention be? Well, I would say it should be on what is in your control. So what, when you go to an audition or you're putting yourself forward as an artist, what kind of things can you control? Your personality when you walk into a room. Absolutely, and that's really important. Good answer, Amanda, thank you. Hi. Uh, we, got, we got two at the same time. Uh, Hi, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, how you treat the other people auditioning. Absolutely, absolutely. Be a good human being in the room because everything follows you in and out. Good, what else? Your outfit. Your clothes, hello, right. It's a conscious choice. What you, what you wear makes a statement and it's totally in your control. Great answer, what else? How prepared you are. Oh my gosh, ding, ding, ding. How prepared you are. I can't tell you how many times I've seen uh, actors and singers walk in and bomb an audition for no reason other than they were unprepared. I'm gonna actually share this. This is a 100% true story and it was uh, about six months ago in Copenhagen. I got invited to sit in on the auditions for Matilda uh, that they're doing at the, the Royal Theater in Copenhagen. And I was just a fly on the wall. I'm trying to learn the, the industry here in Denmark. And so, so I wasn't actively participating. So it kind of gave me the distance to sit back and just be an observer. I had no skin in the game. I wasn't actively recruiting actors. I was just watching. And a guy who I know walked in, he had been called in for an appointment to uh, sing for, I think the father or something, I can't even remember what role. And they had asked everybody to bring in one song of their own and a song that they had sent them from Matilda. And this guy walks in and he was very at ease and comfortable. And, uh, and, and they said, hi, Christian, thanks for coming, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and and he, he said, before they could even say anything, uh, no, sorry, they said to him, we'd like you to start with the song from Matilda. And his response was, I'd like to start with my own song, if that's okay. Mistake number one, attitude, right? Bad idea. But they were like, okay, they were being polite. Maybe he's nervous. Okay. So he does his song and it turns out that it's a song that he himself wrote. So he knew it well. He had this whole thing that, that he did with it. It was fine. And they said, great. Now we'd like to hear the song we sent you three days ago from Matilda. And he says, can I borrow a music stand? Yeah. He sets his the sheets on, on a music stand and he's reading it and it's clear he hasn't prepared this material. He's at a callback. He's at an appointment callback for a major production at the Royal Theater in Copenhagen. And he didn't do the preparation. And when he walked out, all they did was talk about him and say, wow, I, I thought he was talented, but my gosh, I would never wanna work with him. And not only did he shoot himself in the foot for that particular show, those, that casting team is never going to want to give him another chance because they felt disrespected because he didn't do the preparation. So preparation is huge, 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 huge. What else? What else is, is in your control? Um, what? Oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, kind of like what Piper said, how you treat uh, the accompanist as well. Hmm. So important. So important. Jason, what were you going to say? Um, what what you bring, what your material is, um, and how it suits you or how it suits the role that you're going for. Listen, I cannot emphasize how important that is. And I, I, I've, I, as I understand it from, from uh, my early communication with Renee, I think there's a varied set of interests within this group. So I, I'm, I'm trying not to only focus on the theater world, but I think this is in regards to any sort of audition you go for, whether it's instrumental or singing or opera or theater that you make a statement with the material you choose. And I wanna warn all of you, uh, any of you that are interested in doing theater are probably gonna find yourself um, connected with coaches of some sort, someone who's gonna help you with auditions, someone who's gonna, you know, maybe a singing teacher who's gonna say, oh, this song would be great for you, or this scene would be great for you for a monologue. And I think my advice to all of you would be take that with a grain of salt. 
someone might give you a great idea and, and, and they send you a song or a monologue and you look at it and you go, yes, I relate to that. I love it. It's, it sits in my wheelhouse. I, I feel like it, I can share who I am through this piece. A amen, thank you. Other times you're gonna get a song and it's just gonna feel like an assignment. Someone said, oh, this will really show off your voice. And you go, okay. And so you sing it and it shows off your voice, but it doesn't tell us anything else about you. Really, really, really remember friends, especially as you're going through school. And, and, and I say this with all respect to your teachers because there is something to be learned from having to tackle material that is assigned to you. When you walk out of school and you go into the profession, into an audition, you are responsible for what you choose. So if you tank an audition, you don't get to go, well, my voice teacher told me that would be a great song, but I guess they were wrong, right? You have to take responsibility. It is in your control the material you choose. And it's a huge, huge, huge part of how you can be successful in this industry. These are great answers. I'm going to jump ahead and sort of throw all the things up there that, that, that I had come up with over the years doing this presentation. Uh, your hair color and your hairstyle. We, we talked about how, uh, how you look is, is only controllable to a certain extent. So, so some of these things, you know, we, we know we can't control our height or our gender or our ethnicity, but we can change our haircut or our hairstyle, we can change our weight or our body shape to some extent, right? If, 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 we, if all the roles we're interested in require a certain physique, it is within our control to make an attempt to, to have that physique. Our wardrobe, we mentioned, uh, your headshot, your photograph, right? And your resume, those are in your control and they need to make a statement about you. Uh, your skill set. a few years ago, all of a sudden, Every show on Broadway wanted people playing instruments, right? We had Once and we had Rock of Ages and um, we had American Idiot. And we had all these shows, mostly guitar, but, but all sorts of instruments. We had the whole John Doyle musical phase where, where there was uh, singing musician actors. So if you see that the industry is going a certain way, you have the control over what your skill set is. Pick up an instrument, go take lessons, take singing lessons, take dancing lessons. Uh, your education, which obviously all of you are taking control over, at least just in being here, which I think is exciting. Your attitude we mentioned, your preparation we mentioned. Geographical location is a big one, right? Everybody seems to think that the, the center of the universe is New York. And for the musical theater world, it is, right? New York is the, the heartbeat of the world of musical theater. But if you want to be a singer-songwriter, there's no need for you to be in New York. If you want to do improv theater and improv comedy, Chicago is a much better option. If you want to do film and television, it used to be LA, now it's kind of all over the place. So choosing your geographical location based on what your life ambitions are can be really important. Do you want to be a small fish in a huge sea or would you rather be a big fish in a small sea? Um, social media, ooh, this is a big one, right? What you post on social media lasts far beyond that that angry moment that you had, right? Or that party, that drunken partying moment that you had. No matter how private your settings are, anything you post on social media can come back for better or for worse. So I, I won't dwell more on that, but I would just say it is in your control. Be careful with it and use it for good. Um, your authenticity. This is a big one. You have the decision when you walk into a room, are you going to be authentically you or are you going to try to be something you're not? And again, I would go back to that uh, slide that made, I think it was Piper so upset uh, with the different logos, right? That's being inauthentic. When Macintosh comes in with the McDonald's logo or Google comes with the, uh, the Coca-Cola logo, that's being inauthentic. You have the choice to be authentic. And I promise you, I've been in so many audition rooms from colleges all the way up to Broadway level theater. Authenticity counts for way more than any other factor in the game. And then uh, your connections, who you know, right? We, we, we hear this all the time. How do you make connections? How do I take control of that? How do I build a network? I wanna share a few quick thoughts with you on this. I have a little phrase that I teach my students all the time and it, we call it hashtag the power of asking. And an example of this might be, I'll get an email or a text from a former student that'll say, hey, you know, I moved to Chicago and I really wanted to uh, learn how Steppenwolf Theater does their casting. So I found out who the casting intern is and I reached out to them and I asked if I could buy them a cup of coffee and pick their brain for half an hour. Hashtag power of asking, right? Uh, I wanna write a musical 
and I want to collaborate with this pop band that I'm a big fan of. It's a long shot, but I have a connection who has a connection who has a connection, and I'm going to reach out and ask. Hashtag power of asking. Sometimes building a connection network just comes from having the boldness to ask. Because when you think about it, the worst thing somebody can say to you is, sorry, no, right? You want to you wanna mentorship with an actor or a singer that you really admire. Most of the time, you'll be surprised at how kind and generous people are with their time. There is this sort of pay it forward thing, in, especially in the arts. But again, if you ask and you are ignored or denied, what have you lost? Get it? So this, this power of asking is something I really want to enforce with you guys. Again, it's back to that empowerment. Why not ask for it if I have an idea? This idea of build it before you need it. And that comes directly from a chapter of a book that I've listed there called Never Eat Alone. And it's all about network building. And, and the thing he says about this idea of build it before you need it is you should be thinking of how to build a network throughout your whole development. Meet be the kind of person that wants to meet people and get to know people and stay in touch with people, not just when you need something, right? Don't just reach out to somebody and say, hey, we haven't talked in six years. I don't know if you remember me, but uh, you know, I could really use a job right now. And I see that you're running this, this uh, music studio, right? Build, build that network and, and foster it. And don't just be the person who reaches out only when you need something. And then again, as I've already said, use your social media for good, not for evil. I'm sure you can read between the lines and understand what I mean by that. And then later in your life, uh, as, as you, especially as you get into college and you have opportunities to attend presentations or seminars or you know, maybe a meet and greet or, or those kind of things, get, put yourself in a position to shake hands with people or bump elbows with people or whatever we're doing now after Corona. Um, put yourself in a position where you're meeting people and building a network and establishing a reputation, okay? Any questions so far? I'm like flying through this, I know, but I'm trying, as I said, to, to get through the gist of the information and leave time at the end for questions. So any, any questions, comments so far, concerns? Okay, cool, moving on. Your brand is your promise. Once you figure out who am I, what, what's, my, what's my golden arch or what's my, you know, silver apple, it becomes a promise. And I want to share a quick story with you about this company, Snap Fitness 24-7. I was at a conference in Perth, Australia, uh, about five years ago, and I was out for a jog. This is when I used to stay in good shape and jog every morning. And I ran past at like six in the morning, I ran past one of these franchises and I stopped and I took out my phone. And of course, the branding nerd in me was like, oh, I have to use that in a presentation. This is such a great example of concise branding. What do we know about this company just from what you see here? It's fast. It is fast. Yes. What else? It's open all day, every day. All day, every day. It's not going to break the bank. It's not going to break the bank, right? So they've told you, they've, they have basically said to you, fast, convenient, affordable. Right? Those, that's their brand. They picked three things that they want to be known for. It's in their name, Snap Fitness, right? We think fast, 24-7, convenient, right? Uh, uh, the, the, the logo, the little sort of running person, whatever that is, has this feeling of speed to it. So all of their branding is contained within this. Now, I would ask you, does this mean that they don't have nice equipment because it doesn't say fast, convenient, affordable, nice equipment? Does it mean that they don't offer cardio kickboxing or pole dancing classes? Does it mean that they don't offer childcare or have a smoothie bar? No, there might be a whole lot more to them than fast, convenient, affordable. Can we agree? There might be, I would imagine that there's more than just, well, it's fast and convenient and cheap. I would imagine that they try to create a nice environment, that they try to offer other things. But the point is they've decided that those three things are gonna be what they put forward. First and foremost, what you should know about Snap Fitness 24-7 is fast, snap, convenient 24-7, and affordable, okay? And, and in, in, the, uh, uh, in the photograph that I actually took of the, of the building in Australia, there was a banner underneath the Snap Fitness 24-7 that said no joining fee, and that's where they got affordable in there as well. So again, you cannot be all things to all people. So part of the branding exercise is to say, okay, what are the things that are most important that I want people to know about me right away? 
and then they can get to know me a little bit more. Does this make, I, I hope this makes sense. I'm gonna just assume it is, otherwise you'll ask questions. So how does a person begin to craft a brand? How does a company or a person begin to craft a brand? I'm gonna go so fast through this and give you a very broad overview. And then again, I'm gonna share this slide presentation with Renee and you, you are all welcome to reach out and contact me later on if you have questions or wanna dig a little deeper into this. But the first thing in figuring out your brand is to know who you are, your authentic self. And I have a, a couple of exercises that I'm gonna sort of offer you to think about or to play with on your own. The first one is an adjective exercise. And if we were taking the time to do this, normally I would take about five minutes now and I would ask you all to sit and for five minutes, just write down as many adjectives as you can think of to describe yourself. So it starts with myself. And these can be, these should be very honest. It's not about you know, only coming up with the best things. You could say I'm chaotic. You could say I'm, I'm overly sensitive. You, you know, there can be negative things as well. It's just sort of a brain dump of all the adjectives you would use to describe yourself. You don't edit it. You don't pick it apart and figure, you know, try to be right. You just brain dump. The next part of the exercise would be to go around to people that you know in various relationships, right? Anyone from boyfriend, girlfriend, best friend, brother, sister, sibling, to classmate, to maybe a teacher, maybe uh, someone you've sat in class with for you know three semesters and never spoken two words to that person. Get a range and just ask all of these people, hey, I'm, I'm curious to know what are three adjectives or four adjectives you would use to describe me? And you, you, the first part of this exercise is to just collect a list, a long list of adjectives, and not to figure out what it all means yet. That's step one. Step two is you go in and you sort of curate that list and you sort of, oh, these are synonyms. These all go together. Six people told me that I was, you know, spiritual. So that's maybe valuable information. Oh, this one person told me I was quiet and that's because this person sits next to me in science class and I hate biology. So I never speak in there. So that's an outlier. I can, I, I know I'm not a quiet person. I'll cross that out, right? You kind of, you kind of examine the list of adjectives you've got, and then you kind of uh, categorize things and figure out what goes together and what information do you get from other people? Are people seeing you as you'd like to be seen? Are people maybe surprising you by saying things that you hadn't thought of yourself? Are people sharing things that, that you aspire to be, right? Um, the last part is to go in and select the three or four adjectives that are most meaningful and most closely aligned with who you are and what you value. And then to find a way to sort of do some wordsmithing and come up with, some, with something that sounds marketable. I know I'm going super fast through this. I hope it makes sense. I think for you, uh, for this group that are on the younger end, I wouldn't think in terms of creating your brand, but I think the adjective exercise can be super helpful, especially if you want to do theater, because if I know that I'm intellectual, spiritual, and uh, grounded, for example, and those are my highest values, then I'm gonna look for material. I think, I can't remember who said this before when we talked about what's in your control, but we mentioned what material you come in with to an audition. If I'm looking for material, characters that are uh, intellectual, spiritual, and grounded, then they're gonna be closely aligned with me as a person. Does that make sense? So I'll be able to be authentically me even as I play a character. That's where the value of this can apply to you at your age where you are now. And I think this can also apply to singers, songwriters, musicians, dancers, knowing who you are and knowing what your authentic self is and what you wanna sell in the room can start from this adjective exercise. So I highly recommend. The second one, and this is really specific, I think to theater and to uh, maybe to singer songwriters is who are your role models? Um, if you're ever, uh, if any of you are going to be have aspirations of being an actor, eventually you may find yourself in a room meeting with a, an agent, a talent agent. This is one of the questions they almost always ask, which is, who are your role models? Who do people compare you with? And this, this can be useful in that you get a sense of a frame of reference of who you are. Are there other actors or singers or dancers out there that you can compare yourselves to? Not because you're not independent 
not because you aren't your own person, but because maybe it helps someone to understand, oh, it's sort of like if Billie Eilish met, you know, Adele. Oh, okay, that gives me an idea of what that sound is or that style of songwriting. And so, for example, uh, using actors, you might say, you know, sort of humor and style of Ben Stiller meets the boyish outlook of Matthew Broderick. I'm not even sure if these references mean much to you because um, you're all much younger, but these are actors that, that I would compare myself to, that I've often been, people when, when I had hair used to tell me all the time that I reminded them of Ben Stiller. Um, and I've always thought very much uh, of myself similar st in style to Matthew Broderick as an actor as well, because no matter how old he gets, he still has this sort of boyish outlook on the world. So that can give someone a frame of reference as to who I am. Or someone might say, I'm rugged like Jennifer Lawrence, but refined like Audrey Hepburn. So you can kind of create a frame of reference for people to go, okay, I get kind of what you're about. So that's another uh, exercise in this, in this branding process. The third one, and the last one I'm gonna share with you today is this idea of dream roles. And again, this is really specific to the world of acting and musical theater performance, but it's really important to know what roles are out there for you right now in your age range, your type and abilities. What kind of work are you perfect for? And then I think it's really important to know what is it that draws you to these roles, right? I wanna play Elphaba, why? Because she belts, well, that's boring. I wanna play Elphaba, why? because she is different and she's not afraid to be different and she's comfortable in her own skin and she forges her own path and she's determined and she is resilient, right? See how that can be useful? That tells me something about you as a person. And the roles that you're drawn to, hopefully, have something to do with the kind of person you are. Again, I'm gonna speed through this. I hope this is landing in some way because I wanna wrap this up in the next three minutes so that I can leave room for questions. This we're not going to worry about, we're not going to create a branding statement, but just to give you an idea of what this would look like, very much like fast, convenient, affordable. These are some branding statements that some of my students uh, have created in, in their careers. Um, steadfast, savvy, vibrance, unflinching, unusual, unmistakable. Uh, innovative, organized leadership is actually my personal branding statement. Um, et cetera, et cetera, you can see that. There's also sort of catchphrase that, that some people will do. Uh, I had a, a young actress who, who her sort of catchphrase was vibrant grace and that really resonated with her. I had a dancer who was very, very quiet and never spoke in class and sat in the back and you wouldn't think much of her. And then you see her on stage and she was electric. And so she called herself quiet fire. It was this like, there was this burning in her and she was such an artist, but you, she wasn't, you know, waving her hands and, and being very ostentatious about it. I had another friend, uh, a Jewish guy who's just very, very much puts himself out there and calls himself Doug Shapiro, fearless mensch. And he very, very much leans into the sort of, I'm a nice Jewish boy that your mother, you could take home to your mother, that kind, of, that kind of thing. These are all brands that these artists have created that help guide them in their decision-making and the kind of work they do. It's really important that if and when you do this work, that it becomes something that you can live. So it's not something that you necessarily put on. I don't sort of go, oh, I've got an audition. I better become my brand. It should be something that you just are. It's, it's inherent in your values. It's inherent in how you live your life. And then the last step eventually, again, I know I'm speeding through this like crazy, but eventually you're going to broadcast that brand once you have it. We talked about the clothes you wear. Clothing makes a statement of, of your brand, your headshot or your photograph, your resume and what you put on your resume and what you leave off of your resume. This is a way of broadcasting your brand. Your audition materials we talked about, social media, a website eventually, don't worry about that now. Um, your reputation, right? That guy, Christian in Copenhagen who blew his audition because he didn't prepare, that's now connected to his reputation. Um, that's part of his brand. Your lifestyle, how you live your life in general is a way of broadcasting your brand, your personal values. Uh, last thing I wanna share with you real quick is, and again, I'm sending this to Renee so you'll have this, but if you're kind of like me and, and this interests you and you wanna nerd out a little bit more about this and find out how this can apply to you, these are a, a list of, of a short list of books that I've found super helpful. Basically, anything by Malcolm Gladwell is going to change your life. He's 
a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man. And all of his books have had a huge impact on me. Uh, Seth Godin wrote, writes great business books. Purple Cow is my favorite. That his, the whole idea behind it is if you're on a road trip with your family and you've never seen a cow in your life and you see one, you know, as you cross the cornfields of Illinois and you're like, whoa, there's a cow. And then a few miles later, there's another one and another one. Eventually, the cow isn't going to be so exciting anymore because you've seen so much of it. And the whole idea is creating a purple, if you saw a purple cow, that would really stand out. So in, in terms of creating a business or a brand, how can you stand out? Um, anyway, you can read the rest of these. Uh, Elizabeth Gilbert isn't really writing business books. It's just much more about life philosophy. Same with Brene Brown. These are all authors that I think can be super helpful to you on your journey of finding your authenticity, your voice and, and your path in life. And then that's pretty much it. My contact information is here. You don't have to write down because you're going to get this whole slide presentation. And those are the two books that I have written that are available through Amazon um, that may be useful. The, the Act Like It's Your Business is sort of this whole thing expanded. And then for those of you that are specifically interested in musical theater, I do have a book on auditioning for musicals. Okay. That was a lot and I feel like I just vomited a ton of information at you very quickly and I hope that some of it lands but let me uh Renee is it cool if I just sort of open up and say any questions comments concerns feelings yes Piper um as a teenager I think we can all relate to the fact that we might not fully know ourselves yet um and sometimes when I want to like if I have a dream role, it's not necessarily because like, oh, this person is so strong, but more like, oh, she's just like powerful and scary. And like, I want to be powerful and scary or something. Okay. Is that an okay thing rather than something more deeper or should you like lie and pretend like it's something deeper? I don't know. I, I think we should never lie. I think that's, that goes against the whole authentic thing. But I think, I think it's really important for you to start kind of parsing and, and saying, okay, this is a role that I just think would be fun versus this is a role that really is who I am right now. You know, if you walked in, you, and I, I can't even see you standing up, so I have no idea how, how tall you are. I've never heard you sing. Or, but if you walked in the room and said, you know, I really fancy myself as, you know, Mrs. Hannigan and Annie, I would say, well, maybe in your high school production where, where teenagers are playing adults, okay. But you see that, that role is just something that, oh, that would be fun to do someday. But if you said to me, oh, I really wanna, um, you know, uh, I wanna be in 13, or I wanna be in Be More Chill, or I wanna be in Heathers, or I wanna be in Mean Girls, those would make more sense to me because I go, okay, now you're thinking kind of in the real world, the here and now. Does that make sense? So I think, I think it's perfectly okay to have those, oh, that would be fun, that would be really cool, or someday I wanna do that kind of thing. But I also think it's important to go, what am I right for right now? So a dream role is more like if you had a role right now that you could have, what would be your favorite in like where you are at right now? Yeah, in this world, in, 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 this, in this world of what we've talked about today, it's really about knowing what are, the, what are five roles I could play? If I want to be a musical theater major in college and I want to audition for schools, they're going to ask you this question in an interview. They're going to say, what are your dream roles? And what they mean is not, I want to play, you know, um, Tenard, Madame Tenardier when I'm 50 years old, what they mean is, oh, right now I'm perfect for Cosette. So that's a dream role. Right now I'm perfect for uh, Natalie in Next to Normal. So that's a dream role. And, and instantly you list these roles and we go, okay, she knows who she is. She knows sort of what boxes she checks. She's realistic maybe about, who, about what she brings into the room. That's, that's kind of how I mean it in this regard. Makes sense. Also, what's funny about what you said is I just played Patrice in 13 and it was a dream role. <laughs> okay. But again, here's, this is, this is, a, I'm, I'm glad that you, that, that this happened because this is a perfect example of what I mean. I'm not casting that show, but I'm sitting here looking at you and that's one of the first things that comes to my mind. So that's where branding can be really powerful. If you just trust that your authentic self is enough and that you're going to get cast in the roles you're supposed to, as opposed to saying, let me go in and show them that I can do this thing that isn't really me. So that's how I think this can apply to, to all of you right now, even at your young age. You don't have to worry about the branding statement and the marketing and the website, but knowing who you are and sort of what your values and what your core authentic human being is and what roles kind of 
connect in some way to that will help you a lot because when you come into audition for I was going to say for me but really any audition room I've ever been in or heard about what they want is they want to know who you are they don't want to see all the funny things that you can do all the characters you can play and the broad range I 99% of the time when someone comes in and does a monologue where they're like falling on the floor and crying and you know beating their hearts and you know suicide and cancer and rape and all of these dramatic subjects 99% of the time if we ask them to stay and, and work a little we ask them to simplify simplify some just sit down just show us who you are stop trying to show us all the things you can do same thing with belting and sorry this is towards the ladies but you know women in auditions tend to want to show off the voice and with time, you'll start to get the confidence to know it's not always about how big my voice is. It's about how authentic I can be. I'm going to stop and let you ask some more questions. Jason, go ahead. Um, I was wondering from the very, one of the very first things you said today um, was about how when you were a major in musical theater, when you're majoring in musical theater and you wanted to um, direct, what was it about you that you realized that your passion for this was actually in another form? Or even though you loved performing, what, what was it that really made you realize that? It's a great question. Um, the short version is uh, there was a student group that was putting on one act and they were looking for people to direct and I'd never done it. I thought, oh, that'll be fun. And I, I did it. I just dove in and directed a small show with some student friends. And I was like, yeah, this is it. I think I've always been better at sort of the big picture. Um, and I have a hard time trusting directors when I'm an actor in a show because I'm always going like, why did they make that choice? Why, why, why is that character exiting stage right when they entered from stage left? That, you know. So I, I think I've always had a more of a mind for, for that. But that's the okay. short. Great, thanks. And um, to follow up, what, um, what steps did you take once you knew you wanted to sort of shift your focus where you were studying um i i guess i uh i don't really know the whole process of that or how difficult or sort of ominous and scary that could be to sh sort of shift that focus it was, it, it was terrifying but i had very good mentors and i happened to be at a musical theater program that also had an mfa directing program attached so they were very nice and they let me take some of the directing seminars and they let me do some projects with guidance so so i just got very lucky and had great mentors but again power of asking right that you you might think that there aren't options open to you but you know for example when i've done these seminars and i've had college students from other schools say hey can i follow up with you and ask you more questions i always say yes power of asking so so don't be afraid to ask for help or or pitch an idea to somebody if you have it thank you Maybe we have time for one more. Or no, I'm really. so sorry. We have to move on, but I do know that Amanda has a question, so I promise I will get it from her and Amazing. follow up. Thank you. I just want to, everyone, can we give a round of applause to Jonathan? I think that was amazingly helpful. Thanks for, for, for inviting. Absolutely. We're so glad to have you here. Um, and to wrap up uh, our final day of our Songbook Academy uh, classes. So it was a real treat, Jonathan. Amazing. And I'm going to send you the PDF that you can share with everybody. And really, everybody, feel free to reach out if you have questions. I'm, I'm honestly happy to, to help any way I can. Absolutely. Well, thanks, everybody. All of you here are going to head on to your next class. All of you watching, thank you for being here. And thank you for being here with us this week. Um, if you enjoyed today's talk back, please consider supporting this year's Songbook Academy by texting songbook all caps, one word, to 91999 or visiting the songbook.org slash donate. Thanks again. And we will see you in August for our virtual showcases. So visit the songbook.org to see all these talented young singers perform. Okay.